So this is a flippant question, but I can't, I can't help myself. 13 years? Were you waiting for a sign, Jim, that maybe the first film was popular or? Actually, I was, I was sitting, you know, kind of quivering in the girl, hugging my knees for about 10 years. And <laughs> then I decided to go ahead and really make the movie. Why do you come to us? I just want to keep my family safe. When did you start actively thinking about a sequel? You know, the truth be told, we didn't start actively thinking about it until 2012. So a full two years later. Because to me, that's hysterical. The biggest film of all time. And you're thinking, does the world want another one? No, we're, we're thinking that we as individuals have other things in our lives we ah. want to do. Um, Jim, in particular, wanted to go to the Mariana Trench. Bottom of the ocean. That's right. When in doubt, just do it all. Right? Do it that's all. always been my philosophy. Let's see, Deep Ocean Explorer. Uh-oh, that's not good. Movie director. And action. action. You know, why choose? You know, do I have to choose? Just do it all. What took us long, number one, the principle of doing something right. Number two, the fact that we decided to do four sequels and not one. So we needed to write four scripts. That took time. Writing a script before you shoot a movie? Why do blueprints before you build a house? Yeah, right. Exactly. I know one thing. Wherever we go, this family is our fortress. It takes months out of your life. This took a year and a half, this one. Well, more than that. We started about, we started conversations with about 2013. Wow. Me and, I know me and Zoe still did some performance capture this year. And Jim only locked the movie off a couple of days ago. So. Shut yeah. the yeah, front door. It's, it's not like it was a 10, you know, 10 year holiday. There's always been someone out of this, you know, thousands creative team working on it. You know, we're, we're just a small cog in this thing at Absolutely. the end of the day, because there's all these designers and tech guys and creatives, you know. We depend on we're part each of and the every, you Avatar know, family we depend on each on. other, yeah. yeah. Dad, I know you think I'm crazy. I'm those big rocks. But I feel her. This is gonna sound a bit strange, but hello, teenager. Yes. How does that feel? It was fun. <laughs> I hear her heartbeat. It was challenging, but it was, I loved my character. She's so close. Yeah. Yeah. But it's strange to think, okay, what would a teenage hybrid Navi, you know, there's a lot of layers here. Yeah. Luckily, a lot of layers are specified in the scripts. And she's so different from everyone else, mm -hmm. but she's quite ambivalent about. So what does her heartbeat sound like? But I felt there was great heart in it. And she's quite a gentle character, which stands out in a movie like this. Mighty. And I had a long time because we kept postponing beginning to refind my 14 year old and spend time in classes with that age group and listen to the pitch of their voices and all that stuff. It's a sort of Billy Madison image where you're sitting in those little school chairs. There's a bunch of kids all around you. <laughs> Luckily, I'm sitting in the background, just <laughs> observing, trying to be invisible. <laughs> if you want to live here, you have to ride. Let's do it. What physically is the set looking like for a layman for the underwater scenes? Right, so it's a set without a set. So your coral reef is going to be some pieces of tubing that are screwed together to create contact points for the, for the actors. So if they're pulling themselves through coral, we don't build the coral. Um, we build that which they need to touch and then we, we, kind of, we kind of warp reality to fit their hand contacts mm -hmm. later. And that's the gig. We only build what supports the actors and what they're in physical contact with. The way of water connects all things. I was wondering what your initial reaction was to him saying, so, underwater? I remember yeah. I wasn't quick to respond. <laughs> well, I was, I, I was I trying was, to interpret what he meant. I was, I was like, already mm, bombing in, in the water. Languages. I wasn't even thinking. <laughs> Belly frog. <laughs> Silly Jake Sully just diving straight in and then figuring out what are we meant to be doing, boss? 
Zoe, like, you're not just going to be performing, like, at a foot underwater. You're going to be 30 feet underwater. And I remember I did take a pause. I was like, <laughs> that's, a, that's awesome, you know, because obviously you're not going to turn down the challenge. This is our home. I need you with me. And I need you to be strong. We did get trained for a whole year before we had to go underwater. And when I see the movie, I see our ease in that world, which I don't think we could act mm. if he just thrown us in and said, now we're going to do the water stuff. It, we look like we're at home in that element. You're actually, and I know this is being stupid, underwater. Yes. Mm -hmm. With... No, we're You're free diving breath. the whole it's time. It's free diving yes. the whole time. The only person that got to scuba underwater is Jack champion as spider and they made a mask for him because he was jim's favorite yeah that's right yeah you can breathe underwater don't worry we've got special you, human yeah. boy yes yeah, sp special human yeah. boy <laughs> just breathe breathe i mean what we did was initially is we went out into the ocean so that they could go down and and you know just interact with the coral reef and see the wonders for themselves course, and yeah. then have it in their minds later um, but we also went out into the ocean with uh, functional mock-ups of the creatures that could actually fly and dive and do hydrobatics underwater and all the things that they do in the movie. And, and it sounds impossible, but the, we did it with uh, water jet propulsion. So I don't know if you've ever seen these at resorts. They have these guys that go up in these platforms and they fly around 25 ah. feet up and they do flips and things like that. We took that technology, developed it further, and made a four jet version of a skim wing. And the skim wing could go 20 miles an hour underwater, pop out of the water, fly around, and then Amazing. dive back in. And then we put people on it <laughs> just to see what would happen, right? Because that's my whole approach to life. Let's just see what happens, right? What's the worst that could happen, <laughs> right? And I like to get in and actually do the kind of physical ergonomics of it myself so Off I can feel it and then develop it with the, with the other. So it, it's almost like choreography. We're figuring out the choreography. I don't think the audience cares about the technology, but I think it's good for them to know that everything that you see a character doing is actually being done by a person. Yes. It's not just sort of made up CG animation. They're, somebody's doing it somewhere. When was the last time you had a conversation with Matt Damon? <laughs> Jim Cameron called me. He offered me 10% of Avatar. Oh, God. <laughs> He's beating himself up over this, and I really think, you know, Matt, you know, you're kind of like one of the biggest movie stars in the world, get over it. But he had to do another Bourne film, which he was, which was on his runway, and there's nothing he could do about that, and so he had to regretfully decline. If I cross my fingers, could we have a Matt Damon cameo just at the oh, very yeah. end? We must do it. We have to do it so that the world is in equilibrium again. <laughs> but he doesn't get 10% for it. Fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Matt. I know you're thinking it. <laughs> I know. There's even a syndrome called Avatar Syndrome where people are very upset at not being able to stay in Pandora. And we've had a lot of press come through here with Avatar dresses and avatar t-shirts and socks and whatever you know i think it's great <laughs> the fully painted head to toe yeah i mean good for them that's awesome but yeah. i think people went into the cinema watched it and then went back in straight away because they didn't want to leave yeah the planet and i feel the experience this time is so immersive you're an immediate member of this family they don't let go of you until you leave the theater and it's so seamless it's really a portal to another world. So I hope they all have their avatar syndrome syndrome pills ready. <laughs> and they also have the kind of the the happiness of knowing there are four more, you know? So yeah. <laughs> including this one. I took the dog tags home and I st they hang on a on a picture of the amp suit, actually, and uh, I lent them to my grandson, Ike. He wanted to be Quaritch for, th for uh, Halloween this year, and he was, and so he, he, he wore the, them. Your grandson wanted to play your character at Halloween. It doesn't get better than that. Yeah, it was good. That's exactly great. right. You're right about that. What did you make of that Ryan Gosling Saturday Night Live papyrus? It's haunted me. Not really. <laughs> I couldn't give a shit.
I can't eat. I can't sleep. What's wrong? It haunts me. It is pretty funny. I'm just astonished that they spent that much money <laughs> on a little cinematic vignette that's around such a, you know, wispy, thin concept. I forgot about it for years, but then I remembered that Avatar, a giant international blockbuster, used the papyrus font as its logo. I said, all right, guys, we are now doubling down. We're using papyrus for everything. <laughs> Over the makeup truck to say on the side, <laughs> in papyrus, yes. makeup. Yeah, exactly. But the funniest thing about that whole story is I didn't even know it was papyrus. Nobody <laughs> asked me. I just thought the art department had come up with this cool font. Yeah. Here's a big question, though. Why do you think the first film was such a success? And I know this is slightly tricky, but there seems to be many similar but different answers to that question. When I gathered a writer's room together in 2013 to really start sort of breaking story across what I conceived at the time as a trilogy, mm -hmm. I asked the room to spend some time to break that down. And, you know, you look at the obvious stuff, you know, the 3D, the colors, the world building, all, that's all the obvious stuff, right? But after a couple of days of discussion, we, we drilled down to, to other sort of secondary and tertiary layers. And we got down to something that I think is critical that we tried to keep in mind, which is that there was a kind of a, a dreamlike subconscious connection that people were actually unable to quantify verbally when they discussed it, you know, with their friends and so on. But there was something that they were connecting with that we had to be well aware of. I mean, there were obvious things about wanting to belong, things that had to do with the epic hero journey, Joseph Campbell, those archetypes. That's all, I think, fairly straightforward. But there was that element that I called, borrowing from Carl Sagan, the numinous, right? No, seriously, yeah. there's something there that touched us and across all cultures, because I think it's important to remember that Avatar was created by somebody who was from Canada. It played very well in North America, mm -hmm. but it made three quarters of its revenue internationally in all other cultures, right? So it was touching people everywhere the mm -hmm. same way, regardless of language or religion or any of those things. So we had to keep that in mind. And we had to try to do that again to the best of our ability. I think we do to one extent or another, and that'll vary by, by the individual viewer, but that was absolutely part of the goal. Then on top of that, you have to layer in a little bit of that, you know, pesky plotting and character uh, development and all that story? stuff. Story? Story, yeah, oh, whatever. No, but so obviously, you know, there's a, mul a multi-layered challenge to writing and then designing and then executing, uh, you know, an Avatar film. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe and click the bell icon to keep up to date. You can listen to my Radio 1 movies and TV podcast, Screen Time, on BBC Sounds. And you can find these interviews in full on BBC iPlayer by searching Movies with Ali Plum. <laughs>